Friends, the Lord be with you. Welcome to the 2022-23 Leonard F. Stoudemire Lecture in Multicultural Ministry. Uh, the Leonard F. Stoudemire Lecture in Multicultural Ministry is named in honor of the late Reverend Leonard Foster Stoudemire, a pioneer African-American clergyman and church planter to Holland, Michigan. Originally, he wanted to enlist into missionary service in Africa. In 19, but in 1944, he migrated to Holland, Michigan, and planted our city's first intentionally multiracial congregation, the All Nations Full Gospel Church of Holland. Uh, the purpose of this lecture is, in fact, to equip seminary students, faculty, staff, alumni, and local congregations with resources for increased intercultural competence for greater effectiveness in Christian ministry. The first lecture was offered in 2011, and the inaugural speaker was Dr. William Turner, who at the time was professor uh, of homiletics at Duke Divinity School. Since then, we've also uh, have had the privilege of welcoming Dr. Willie Jennings, Dr. Daisy Machado, Dr. Sun Chan Ra, Dr. Leah Gunning Francis, Dr. Jamar Tisby, and last year, Dr. Tony Tian Ren Lin, among others. The speaker uh, for today uh, was, in fact, selected and recommended to me by our very own Justice and Reconciliation cohort members. Uh, we made the change last spring. Uh, they, as the, the Justice and Reconciliation cohort is a group of students uh, who are here uh, because of the, they're responding to the call of God to ministry in their lives, but also with particular interest in advancing justice and reconciliation in the church, in our community, and in our world. Uh, last year, they came to me with a suggestion that uh, they want to share and broaden the kind of conversations they were having in their cohorts along with the broader community. And so we came up with the idea that they would become the steering committee uh, for the Leonard F. Stoudemire Lecture. So uh, under the leadership of Kate Barman and Dr. Alberto La Rosa Rojas, as well as Keith Reynolds at the time, uh, they selected uh, the speaker for today. So if you're a member of the Justice and Reconciliation Corps, can you just stand uh, so we can see where you are? Just stand. Don't be shy. I know some front row, back row people. So friends, would you join, will you join me in just expressing our thanks and gratitude to them? Thank you. Thank you. Um, they rec made this recommendation uh, in, I think, around early August of this year, and I was delighted, delighted and so pleased uh, with the person that, who have, they have selected to be this year's lecturer. So they are going to have the honor of introducing our speaker. So let me invite Ruth Langkamp and Lexi Rosado to come and lead us. This is on? Awesome. Um, I just want to give you some ground rules to help us navigate our um, learning environment together. If you are seated or if you were conscious of something being on your chair and you picked it up, um, use that. This is an opportunity for you to use that piece of paper to take notes, ask questions as you're learning and listening. Because later on, we are going to invite you to ask those questions. And if you're like me and you needed some of that time to come up with a good question, that's your opportunity. We will reject your not so good questions. 
so this is this is it, okay? Um, but also, we're really, really excited that you are here with us, and um, we're looking forward to doing this learning together. Let us pray. God, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give you thanks for the many corners of the world that you have gathered us into, and that in this specific time and place, we get to learn uh, what it means to be the body of Christ, what it means to suffer with, what it means to be present in our bodies and in doing so, present in the lives of one another. We pray for our speaker today as she um, leads us in your word and in uh, the wisdom and the learning that she has accumulated over many, many years of walking alongside churches and leaders and just communities. Um, we pray that our ears may be attentive, that our hearts may be moved, and that our actions may be rooted in your scripture. In your name we pray. Amen. I have the pleasure of being able to introduce our speaker, and I just want you to know we are really blessed by being able to have uh, Dr. Reverend Alexia Salvatierra. And so this bio, um, the things that stick out to you, feel free to take notes for when those questions and answers come up. Reverend Dr. Alexia Salvatierra is the academic dean of the Center for the Study of Hispanic Church and Community and the associate professor of Mission and Global Transformation at Fuller Theological Seminary. She is the author of two books, one with Dr. Peter Hetzel, Faith Rooted Organizing, Mobilizing the Church in the Service of the World, and the second book, Buried Seeds, Learning from the Resilience of Vibrant Marginalized Christian Communities, that was written with Reverend Brandon Rencher. She is a Lutheran pastor with over 40 years of experience in congregational and community ministry, including church-based service and community development programs, congregational, community organizing, and legislative advocacy. She is a consultant for a variety of national and international organizations, including World Vision, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and the Christian Community Development Association. She has been a national leader in the areas of working poverty and immigration for over 25 years, including co-founding the National Evangelical Immigration Table in 2011, the New Sanctuary Movement, the Guardian, the, the Guardian Angels Project for Unaccompanied Migrant Minors in 2014. She co-founded and coordinated the Ecumenical Collaboration for Asylum Seekers and the leadership team of Matthew 25 or Mateo 25. And this is a bipartisan Christian network to protect and defend families facing deportation in the name and spirit of Jesus. From 2011 to 2014, she served as the Director of Justice for the Southwest California Synod of the ELCA under Bishop Nelson. From 2000 to 2011, she was the Executive Director of Clergy and Laity United for Ec Economic Justice. CLUCA is a statewide allegiance of organizations of religious leaders who come together to respond to the crisis of working poverty by joining low-wage workers in their struggle for a living wage, health insurance, fair working, by joining low-wage work, oh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> health insurance, fair working conditions, and a voice in the decisions that affect them. Before CLUCA, Reverend Dr. Salvatierra founded multiple programs and organizations in the U.S. and overseas. These included a gang prevention program for at-risk immigrant youth, a community computer center, and an integrational community garden where the elderly taught at-risk youth to grow produce for sale, as well as a, a collaborative of UC students, homeless leaders, and congregational members providing emergency services in the streets of Santa Cruz and the migrant farm worker camps. She was founding director of the Berkeley Chaplaincy to the Homeless, a program that integrated social services, community organizing, pastoral care, and economic development for the homeless. And in the Philippines, she trained urban poor women to serve as chaplains to their neighbors. Please join me in welcoming this Changemaker Award from the Liberty Hill Foundation, Dr. Alexia Salvatierra.
including him. Thank you, dear. Boy, that was a sort of, this is your life. <laughs> Look at all the memories coming back. OK, let's uh, open with prayer. Holy Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing in your sight and provocative and inspiring and refreshing for your people. In your holy and beautiful name, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So I'm going to talk to you today about becoming the body of Christ and changing the world. And I want to start by sharing a story about my daughter. I'm so glad she's not here or watching, because I'm not supposed to do that, but every once in a while I do. So when she was in high school, which was quite some time ago, um, she brought a friend over to the house who had been raised in a home with no religious background or training. And her friend said to me, I'm sort of interested in this Jesus, but only if he really makes a difference in the world. And I was struck by that for a couple of reasons. And one is that I felt like that's the cry of her generation. The other reason is because I, too, was raised in a home without any religious background or training. My family comes from Mexico City and from Russia or the Ukraine, depending on the Donbass. It went back and forth. But my, both sides of my family were socialists and anti-Christianity. So that's how they got together, my parents. And so I became a Christian in the Jesus movement of the 70s. I am that old. And I, uh, I came to know in that movement a Jesus who saved our souls for heaven. You know, and it was really little by little over time that I found out that he does not only bring us eternal life, which is already enough. I'm not knocking eternal life. But he also brings us abundant life that he is about the transformation of the whole person in the whole family, in the whole neighborhood, in the whole community, in the whole society, in the whole world. And if we follow him, if we are his body, we are about that same transformation. So what does that transformation look like? Well, we often in this society tend to think of it in very individualistic ways. I know Jesus, I have a better life. And that's true. But the promise biblically is not only to the individual. I love this scripture. I want us to read it together. I'll read it out loud. This is from the message version, which is usually not the best version, but I love this particular scripture in it. Pay close attention now. I am creating a new heaven and a new earth. All the earlier troubles, chaos, and pain are things of the past to be forgotten. Look ahead with joy. Anticipate what I am creating. I will create Jerusalem as sheer joy. Create my people as pure delight. I'll take joy in Jerusalem, take delight in my people. No more sounds of weeping in the city. No cries of anguish. No more babies dying in the cradle or old people who don't enjoy a full lifetime. 100th birthdays would be considered normal. Anything less will seem like a cheat. They'll build houses and move in. They'll plant fields and eat what they grow. No more building a house that some outsider takes over. No more planting fields that some enemy confiscates. For my people will be as long-lived as trees. My chosen ones will have satisfaction in their work. They won't work and have nothing come of it. They won't have children snatched out from under them. For they themselves are plantings blessed by God, with their children and grandchildren likewise God blessed. Before they call out, I'll answer. Before they finish speaking, I'll have heard. Do we want this? I have spoken in all different kinds of churches, across the political spectrum, all different cultures. Nobody doesn't want this. Amen? The question is, how do we get from here to there? Because some of it clearly isn't going to happen until Jesus comes back. But some of it is all about living in this world. So how do we go from where we are to this? 
One of the things that makes me saddest when I hear it from young people is that nothing has changed. I don't know if you've heard young people say that. Nothing has changed. This country is in trouble, it has been in trouble, and nothing has changed. That makes me so sad because if you really believe that nothing has changed, it's highly unlikely that anything will change. And I want to say that over the course of my lifetime, I have seen tremendous changes. I never saw a woman, let alone a Latina, standing up in a situation like this as a pastor ordained by the church. You know, when I, when I was growing up, not only was racism acceptable, it was legislated. It was in the law. Tremendous change. But how does change happen? The picture on your right, your left, on your left, is a picture of Southern California, of the coast, and those are billion dollar homes falling off the, the cliff. How did that happen? What power could remove that cliff? Well, water doesn't seem like it has a whole lot of power over stone, except over time. Change that is profound is like water. It comes in waves, right? And it ebbs. And when it ebbs, we think, oh, it's not coming. And then another wave comes. Now, the other picture is the, uh, a depiction of the battle between Elijah and the prophets where they build these towers of stone and wood, and then the, they pray for the divine fire to come down, and it doesn't come down on the false prophet's tower, but it comes down on Elijah's tower. Reverend James M. Lawson, Jr., who's one of my mentors, was Martin Luther King, Jr.'s theologian of nonviolence, that Martin Luther King called him the creator of the theory and practice of nonviolence in the civil rights movement. He ran the desegregation of Nashville. So Reverend Lawson says, when he, I heard him say when he was giving a sermon on this scripture, that the divine fire could only come down in God's timing and by God's will. Human beings cannot bring down the divine fire. But the divine fire would not come down without something for it to burn. That they had to build the towers he says movements, and he was, you know, one of the creators of the civil rights movement. He says movements are like the divine fire. They come when God wills. But if we haven't done the hard daily work of building the infrastructure of a movement, the divine fire will not come down because there will be nothing for it to burn. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what that looks like. But before that, I want to talk to you about my experience, probably the most powerful experience I ever had in my life when I was a missionary in the Philippines, of the divine fire coming down. This is the People Power Movement in February of 1986. And I was there, and a million people nonviolently ran over the tanks and deposed the dictator. It was an amazing and miraculous experience. But it happened as a result of a very long period of building the towers. And God's instrument for building those towers was the base Christian community movement. So this next whole sort of main section of my talk is contained more or less in a book that Brandon Rencher and I wrote called Buried Seeds, Learning from the Vibrant Resilience of Marginalized Christian Communities. The book talks about the base Christian community movement and about the independent churches during slavery. And we look at what was in common between those two movements that is relevant for people planting and renewing the church in the 21st century. So I'm going, but I'm going to talk about the five points that are relevant, I, we believe, 
But I'm only going to talk about the base Christian community side of it because Reverend Rencher is the expert on the hush harbors, and I'm not going to pretend to be that. Um, but the base Christian community movement, not only have I researched and studied it, but I lived it. I was part of a base Christian community in the Philippines. I saw what they did. I experienced it. And I knew the movement well in El Salvador. So let me talk a little bit about that movement. It was very strong in Latin America and the Philippines, although it also was in Africa, but it wasn't as strong there. It came out of Vatican II, where Gaudium et Spes, the document coming out of Vatican II, redefined the church in some ways. It said that the church was to be the alma y fermenta de la comunidad. That means the soul and the yeast of the community. So just have that image for a minute. The, soul, the church in the community as soul and yeast. And then to make that real on the ground, they started this network of small groups. Now, the church has always consisted of a network of small groups. When has the church not, any live church, been about small groups? But these small groups were unusual in a few ways. One, they were led by poor and marginalized people. I want to say that again. They were led by poor and marginalized people. According to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that should not have been possible. They didn't have security. They didn't have all of these primary, but they led these communities. They started them. They coordinated them. They led them. Secondly, these communities integrated Bible study, mutual care, and engagement in social transformation. Fully integrated. Mission Integral. So, what did we learn from those communities? So, in each of our chapters, we use an English word that Brandon chose that made sense for him in the African American context, and a Spanish word that came out of the base Christian community. So, our first chapter is about kinship or familia. And of course, right, every Christian community worth its salt is a family. But they took it to another level. So I'm going to mention three ways in which they took it to another level. The first one is the depth of their commitment to each other. To be a member of a base Christian community in the context of civil wars, which is where most of them were, not all of them, was very dangerous. There was a particular point in the war in El Salvador where to be carrying a Bible in public meant you were probably a Bible teacher for a base Christian community, and you could be disappeared. So enormously dangerous. So people in base Christian communities would pledge together to take care of the children, to adopt the children of anybody who was taken. I just want you to imagine that, the depth of commitment involved in that. Secondly, that commitment seamlessly went beyond the community itself, to the barrio. So a little story. Um, a new family came to the Bible study one night. Very poor family. And they rotated the Bible study from home to home. Your home Bible studies. And they said to them, we're going to be in your home next week. And the family looked down at the ground very ashamed and said, you can't be in our home. The roof is, has holes. And they said, well, okay, then we will come on Tuesday and fix your roof. And then we can have Bible study on Friday. <laughs> Family. Familia. And then it extended from one community to another. So there was um, a call, like Paul's call about Macedonia, to the base Christian communities in El Salvador about an area of Nicaragua where there had been a famine. And so they called for people to give. And there was a man who came up and he gave a little bag of beans. It was what he had. It was what he was going to use to eat. And he put it on the altar. And then he started to go back to his seat. And he stopped and he came back and he took off his only coat and he put it on the altar. Familia. I want you to turn to each other. I'm going to have you do this a few times and just share what comes up when you hear all of this. What have been your own experiences of kinship or familia 
And where is this challenging you? So just turn to each other for a minute. We're going to go back and forth. So I'm going to call you back. Any one of these things you could talk about for the next period of time. But I want to give them all to you, sort of a little bit of a potluck, and then you can delve into it later. Um, the second principle, Reverend Rencher called leaderful, and it's called participación in, in the movement. And that means that they took being the body of Christ seriously. Every person has a gift, at least one. And every gift needs to be used for God's mission to be complete. None can be left out. So I'm going to tell you a little story about what that looked like. Um, and then I'll give you a couple of characteristics about how it operated. So Chino... Um, was a bricklayer, or at least he had been a bricklayer before his alcoholism got so bad that basically all he did was drink. Uh, and when he drank, he often be beat his wife and you know, took whatever money there was in the house to drink some more. Um, but they decided in the base Christian community movement that God really wanted them to have a school in their body for their children. So they decided that they would physically build the school building, and then they would demand that the government send them teachers. <laughs> so they had to build the school physically, so they needed a bricklayer. So they came to Chino, and they said, God is calling you to come and build the school. So the way that Chino described it after the school had been built was he said there was a fight between the alcohol in the school and the school won. You see, they, they saw bricklaying as a ministry. They saw every task that builds toward the vision that we saw in Isaiah 65. Every task as a ministry, as a mission. And we need it. We need every single task as much as we need every other task. And to underline that, the coordinating functions were shared, were rotated. So there are always two coordinating functions at every Bible study, at every BCC meeting. One was the basic coordination function that you would have at any meeting, right? And the other one they called animador or animadora, and that's the inspirer. 
that one person was to inspire and the other person was to coordinate. So smart, because sometimes we try to push those gifts together and they don't always really go together, right? But they would train people. They didn't just put people in positions without training them. They would train people. They would train everybody who wanted to be trained. And then they would see who could do it and they would try to help them do it and to grow in it and they would rotate. So I want you again, think about your context. Where are you being leaderful and where are you not? Turn to each other again. So I'm going to call you back together. And I don't think I'm going to stop you for the next three. We'll go through three of them together, and then we'll do this, because we don't have time. I said that they would equip people for their leadership. The process of equipping had two components that were critical. And I'm going to use the Spanish version here, because I think it's clear. Conscientización is a process that was created by Paolo Freire. And it basically says two things. You can't respond effectively to your reality unless you see it, unless you really see and judge reality with all of its essential components. And the assumption is that that's very hard to do because we are programmed by our society to see in certain ways that are lies. That there are people around us who have an interest in us um, being passive, <laughs> so that the power stays in the hands of a few people who don't really want to share it or use it. And so we need to have what Paolo Freire called a hermeneutic of suspicion. It doesn't mean walking around suspicious. It means asking hard questions. Not only what is going on, but why is it going on? So my child is having trouble learning in school. Oh, I say he's a burro. He's just tonto like I am. We just can't learn. We don't say, well, how are they teaching in my school? Does my school have the same resources as a school in a wealthy area? If it doesn't, why? So it's the why question. It's, it's why. It's going underneath. We want to really understand our reality in order to be able to discern God's call 
for how we will impact it. But that was Paolo Freire's piece. The piece that the BCCs added was that we cannot understand who we are in relationship to our reality without the word of God. But if we really pay attention to the word of God and not what people have told us it says, but what it actually says, it's wild in what it tells us we can do. And that is particularly true for people who have been poor and marginalized, who are told over and over again about who they are not and what they cannot do. But the word of God tells us who we are and what we can do. And that the people who are most at the margins are God's particular beloved agents. Corinthians, right? He has chosen, remember, the weak things of the world. Right? So that when people hear this, whoa, everything changes. What can we not do? Maya Angelou says, God plus anyone is a majority. <laughs> Powerful, right? And then they would take this sense of possibility and they were practical about it. You start small. You experiment. Cycles of reflection action. You do something. You see what works. You come back. You pray. You reflect. You read scripture. You think. And then you go back and you try more. The cycles of reflection and action. So that's principle number three that Brandon called, Reverend Renter called, consciousness. Spirit, duality. Holy Spirit, spirituality. Um, I was, when I was writing the book, I went and interviewed some base Christian community leaders. Even though I had experienced it, I was young. I wanted to interview people who'd stayed in it. And I interviewed this one woman, and I said, why did you end up engaged with the base Christian community? And she said, because I was a college student, but I was out visiting some family in this poor barrio, and I went to a BCC, and she said, and I was amazed by the joy. They had such a tangible, glowing, excited sense of joy about them. And what she said was they were joyful in the spirit, but they were joyful also in in." their response to a God who said, the poor will eat. <laughs> they were joyful because they believed God's promise that their children would have enough to eat. <laughs> so it was a very holistic joy, right? I'm joyful because I'm joyful even if I don't have food because the Holy Spirit is lifting me up. But I'm even more joyful because my children will have enough. So this sense of victory in the struggle, of joy in the midst of the process. Then there was an unconquerable hope in these communities. I said earlier it was very dangerous, and people were regularly disappeared and killed. Um, but the ritual in the community is every time you got together in prayer, part of what you would do is you would list the names of the people who had been disappeared and killed. And after every single one of them, the whole group would say together, Presente, here, here in our midst, part of the communion of saints. So just say it together, one, two, three. Presente, the communion of saints all around us. Whew, unconquerable hope. And then they were really fearless. Um, a friend of mine who was also from... He was from El Salvador, then he came when he was very young, then he went back to visit the communities in the midst of the war. And he said that he was in one town that was what they called the liberated zone, in that the guerrilla armies were in control. And there was a um, member of the base Christian community whose son had been visiting family in another county that was under the military and had been killed. And so his family had asked, for members of the base Christian community to come to where he was and get his body and bring him, bring him home. And that was an extremely dangerous thing to do. And the head of the rebel groups, which tended to support the BCCs a little more than the um, army, although not always, but often, 
said, well, we'll we, will send, we will give you some rifles to defend yourselves. And they said, we don't need your rifles. <laughs> and they said, we knew you would say that. <laughs> You know, this sense of fearlessness of God is with us and God has called us and we're not afraid, right? Um, amazing, spirit, duality, right? And then the commitment to reconciliation. Um, there's a story that I give in a, in a certain size form in the book. It's actually available in a much longer form and I'm going to give it to you in a very short form. But Angel was a thug. He was a member of the community who was getting paid by the death squads to terrorize the community. And he wore a necklace of ears of people he had killed. He was a real thug, real deal. Well, typical of the base Christian communities, they decided to go after him to bring him back to the Lord. So they all went there. And it's, it, they're very, it's, these stories are great because these are real people. Like on the way, some of them were saying, so maybe we really should like bring some machetes? And others were like saying, no, you can't. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so um, <laughs> you have to depend on the weapons of the Lord, otherwise it won't work. So they, they end up being up with him all night, all night. And by the morning, he had repented. And sort of the last stage of his repentance is there was a, a picture on the wall of the room in the church with the centurion that... Um, the faithful centurion, right? And he said, he said, can that be me? Like, yeah, that can be you. So he admitted that he was being paid by the government, essentially, to do what he was doing. And, but he came, he came, he reconciled, he came back to Christ and to the community. So they just didn't give up on people. They just didn't give up. Um, that's spirituality. And then, they practice stewardship. Now, what do I mean by that? Not just that, you know, every November they uh, ask people to make a pledge. No, they believe that everything you have been given is to be used for God's will and God's vision. And that mean, meant that they got, they didn't have an arbitrary line between what was political and what wasn't. Anyway, that you could serve God's vision, you would do it. You would get involved with the movements for justice. And of course, people died. <laughs> they already died just by being in the base Christian community movement, but if they got involved with the Farm Workers Association, <laughs> double risk, right? So, um, and not everybody did. There was room for diversity. Diversity of opinion, diversity of commitment. There were people who, if you read, there is a book called The Gospel in Salintaname, which is transcripts of a base Christian community. Bible studies, so overwhelming. And you can see in that community, there are people who are sort of more moderate and more people who are more radical. You, you know, everybody's all together. They don't judge each other. It's really powerful. But they followed as God led into the world. Not of, not of the world, but into the world. And people ran away for the United States and, or for other countries. And other people stayed. But whenever anybody died, they said, this is the cross. This is the cross. I am not dying alone. I am following Christ. Tangible. Now, these are the five principles, so I want you to, your last time of turning to each other, just to reflect right now on whatever came up as you were just hearing these last three principles. Conscientización y el mensaje de liberación, spirituality, spirituality, and faithful organizing. So just spend a couple minutes reflecting with each other. Whatever comes up, whatever the Lord places on your heart, I'm giving you five minutes, so.
am actually going to bring you back a little bit earlier because I realized there was an important story I didn't tell you. So I don't, I don't want to leave it out. So um, I'm going to talk about what it, what it looks like on the ground to do community organizing as if God is real and Jesus is risen. So um, there, were a, there was a group from the base Christian community that was pushing for running water in their barrio. So they went to the mayor, and they were saying, you know, we really believe that as children of God that our children deserve running water, and we would like that to happen in our barrio. And the mayor said, how are a bunch of peasants like you coming up with this? Who is your leader? Who's the outside agitator that came to you? And they look at each other, and they're confused. And the, one of them turns back to him, and he says, Jesus? And he says, no, 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 no. He's very frustrated. He said, no, no. Who's the person, the outside agitator that came in and riled you up and gave you these ideas? And they all look at each other, and they say, look back. They say, Jesus. <laughs> so that's the, other, the other story is there was one point where you know, some theologians, Catholic theologians, were upset because people were just running away with the Bible, right? They gave them the Bible, and they said, this is very concerning, right? And so they said, what about the parts of the Bible you don't understand? And one of the BCC members raised her hand, and she said, you know, excuse me, Father, but the hard parts are not the parts you don't understand. They're the parts you do. <laughs> so just wanted to give you that. <laughs> now... Uh, I want to say that I found out only after I'd written the book. Um, people had mentioned it, but it didn't really sink in until I was hearing a presentation by a young woman named Lauren Potter, who is, has gone back and forth. She's actually somewhere here in the Midwest, but she's gone back and forth living with the current base Christian community movements, who are the grandchildren of the first ones. And these people are now separate from the Catholic Church institutionally. They're ecumenical. Now, the, this movement actually was always ecumenical. Our Lutheran church in El Salvador was very involved in the base Christian community movement. If someone asks me a question during the question and answers, I'll tell you a great story, but not right now because I don't have time. Um, but, <laughs> but it's a great story if you want to hear it. Anyhow, but it was always ecumenical, but officially it was Catholic. But now it's not officially. It's officially ecumenical. And um, every time they have a Bible study, they put water on the altar. Because water is the biggest problem worldwide. Enough water is the problem that we're facing in the 21st century. So they put water on the altar. Because God is the God of the whole universe and cares about every aspect of our lives, individually and communally. So, so I was speaking at a Christian college in Iowa about all of this stuff. And a young man raised his hand and he said, you know, I need to tell you the truth, Pastor. This just feels like a burden. He said, it's hard enough to be a Christian and a student. He said, and then I have to love my neighbor. And then you want me to do all this stuff, right? And what hit me at that point were two things. And this is what I'm closing with. And the first one is that privilege being, means being able to choose your burdens. That if you are born into a family with resources and you can go to a private Christian college, you never have to deal with a public school system that isn't working. If you are born in this country, you never have to deal with an immigration system that isn't working. And if you have... Um, enough resources in your family to get health insurance, you never have to deal with the public health care system that isn't working. But while some of us can choose our burdens, uh, others of us are crushed under the burdens of systems that we can't escape that aren't working. And then we need to bear one another's burdens and thus fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. Um, but that's not bad news. That's actually good news. Because our inescapable connection doesn't just mean more responsibility, it means more resources. You're not alone. <laughs> it's not you individually that has to do all this. It's us as the body of Christ. Amen? So I'm going to end there.
Thank you so much, Dr. Salvatierra, for those wonderful words of wisdom. We're now going to enter into a time of question and answer. So two of my friends over here are going to stand up. They're going to get mics. They're going to go on either side. And we have provided for you a couple of different ways of asking questions. One is the traditional, raise your hand, and somebody will come to you with a mic, and you'll be able to ask your question directly to Dr. Salvatierra. But we also recognize that some of you like to communicate a little differently with, word and pe with pencil and paper, maybe. So you also have little cards, and you can write down a question on the card, and if you lift up your hand, again, one of us will come by, pick up your card, and we will read the question for you. So whichever way feels more comfortable and fitting to you. All right. Does anybody have a question that they have already? And if not, I'm going to start us off with a question. Um, you talk about, um, first of all, thank you so much for being here and for speaking um, and for teaching. Um, you talk about how in that in in the community um, there was space for different views, even within high stakes. Um, what advice or practices would you give to us that would prevent judgment and work towards a community uh, that creates space for unity? So I think we go back to the first principle, which is familia. What if we really took that seriously, that we were one family? Now, I, I mean, I, even as I say that, I'm aware that so many people in our modern world have walked away from their families. But we have an understanding in my cultures, both my cultures, that if your family's not well, you're not well. We aren't just individuals, we're families. That's part of our identity and our being. And so you may not, you know, it's not unusual in my Latino community to um, send a child having a lot of trouble with your parents to live with another member of the family, <laughs> right? I mean, you can, have, you can have pauses. You can separate if you need to, if, you know, a situation is toxic. But your family, you never give up. Because your family is a place where you're, you belong. And it's such a treasure with all of its brokenness. So MARCHA is the United Methodist Church's Hispanic organization. The United Methodist Church is splintering, as many of you may know, not just splitting, splintering. But MARCHA put out a call to all its members to stay together, saying, and people did, saying, we disagree passionately, but we're family. We're familia. We're going to stay together. And we're going to keep talking. <laughs> but we're going to stay together. It is a treasure that we are losing around our gracelessness. We live in a very graceless world. And we are losing the treasure of family. And we are not made to be alone. And I don't think that's just a romantic statement. I think we are made to be in family. And the problem with only being in chosen family is they're going to disappoint you too. You don't know yet, but they will. Any questions anybody would like to voice? I have a card. Um, this is from someone here today. Um, where, if anywhere, do you see an analogous <laughs> community to base Christian community in the U.S. today, or might we need to look elsewhere? So I do want to say that um, we have at the end of the book two stories of two modern communities, Christian communities, that are, are in every way trying to be the same kind of model and in many ways succeeding. And those are just two. I actually know a bunch of them all over the country. Because we're not talking about angels here. We are talking about people. But people can do amazing things. 
when they, and you know, again, it's the divine fire that comes down that you don't control, but the daily infrastructure of life together in Christ, when you allow it to be fully holistic, can be amazing, <laughs> can be life. So um, I do know a number of communities around this country where people are trying to do it, but there are two of them that are in the book, if you want to read more about them. La Fuente Ministries in Pasadena and Mission House in North Carolina. And actually, Brent, the Reverend Renter founded one called Good Neighbor Movement that is also in North Carolina that I think fits the criteria. So, but there's a bunch of them. You know, they're not... What did the Lord say about wheat and weeds is that we're not like rushing around saying, well, this fits and this doesn't. That's not what he wants us to do. But there are a number of little lights popping up of people who are sharing life together in holistic ways. And that's why we wrote this book, was because people who are young who are doing that need, well, people any age who are doing that need models. And these are models, I didn't even name it out loud, but created by people of color and created not only by people of color, but by poor people, marginalized people. So we need models that actually come from the roots, <laughs> right? And so we wanted to give you this, pass it on to you, those of you who are doing this, or trying to do this, or experiencing this, how you can do it more so, pulling a nourishment from the roots. And they are, and there's a number of the models I know personally are not in this country. So they are not only in this country, but if, but, you know, if you don't speak other languages, and, then yeah. Yes. Medical story. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I will. I love, I love, I love, I love my Lutheran church. And the, and the Lutheran church in El Salvador is, the, is a church of the poorest of the poor. You know, around the turn of the century, people, the big denominations divided up the gospel south. You know, I mean, excuse me, the global south. You know that, right? They divided it up which is so weird. But, you know, the Lutheran church got like the poorest people in, in El Salvador. And um, Bishop Madardo Gomez um, was very, very involved in the base Christian community movement. In fact, he was so involved in it that he happened to be in the United States when the Jesuits were killed. There were four Jesuits killed. He, uh, they went afterwards to the Lutheran cathedral to get him. But he happened to be, thanks be to God, in the United States. And the people said, stay there. And he said, no, I'm coming home. But not only did he come home, when he was gone, when they came to get him and he wasn't there, they looked around and there was a cross that they had used on Ash Wednesday. It was the big cross that was in the Lutheran Cathedral. They had used it on Ash Wednesday to have everybody write the individual and corporate sins of the people. So on the cross, there were you know, little pieces of paper stuck on that said things like assassination and torture and all the things that were going on at the same time as they said all the individual sins, right? So all of that was attached to the cross. And so they took the cross. They said it was a cruz subversiva. It was a subversive cross, and they took it. Um, so when he got back to El Salvador, the first thing he did is he got the people from the embassies, from the, actually, the Scandinavian embassies, who had been very supportive of the Lutheran Church. He got the Scandinavian embassies, and they went down to the military, and they demanded the return of their cross with lots of press. It was actually a very, very creative move because it made everything very public, right? And, um, but it was so risky. It was so brave. And so finally, they gave them the cross back because they waited there with all these ambassadors and all this press, and they gave them the cross back. And so they took it back, and they, it's, it hangs there in the Lutheran church. The big, they call it the cathedral, but it's not. It's just sort of a church. But the, <laughs> the Protestant is just sort of a church. But they, the cross hangs there, and underneath they made a plaque that says, Cruz Subversiva. <laughs> <laughs> because the cross is subversive. <laughs> um, and so that's a Medardo Gomez story. Um, but so the Lutheran Church was head over heels involved in the base Christian community movement. Um, and I, but you know, it, it was officially attached to the Catholic Church, but in the mountains, nobody tripped that. It was, who cared, right? It was where the gospel was live. It didn't matter to anybody. Now, that's not typically true nowadays, right? Now there's real war between Catholic and evangelical people in 
many Latin American countries. But at that time, you know, people came together around um, a very different kind of work. Any questions? Just wave us down. Yeah. So, in your work at Bullet Seminary, yeah, yeah. Um, what does it look like from a couple of different students? You know, yeah. uh, you know, the practical things that they can think about through their community context. Yeah. Um, you know, in their neighborhood, um, through the five senses, what kind yeah. of project that looks like for you guys? Yeah, oh, that's a lovely question. I haven't, I haven't. Um, taught a pastoral theology class since we came up with this. I would teach this as part of the pastoral theology class, of course. But part of why this lecture was set up as it was, was I don't believe in talking about something without doing it. So the process that we did of you listening to each other, learning from each other, this is a base Christian community basic, right? This is leaderful, what you did, right? So everything that I do in my courses is always have, we, we always apply. And that's not very hard right now at Fuller because I would say 98% of our Spanish speaking students and probably a good 80% of our other students are in active ministry. Our population at Fuller has changed. Um, we're 80% online, online all over the world. Um, and a lot of our in-person classes are hybrid. Like we have somebody online and somebody in the class. Um, and so everybody online is in ministry. They're home, you know, they're taking courses while they're doing ministry. So it's not, on one level, it makes, it's easy to apply. You, you take it right there, you're in ministry, take it home. Come back and tell us how it's working. Tell us how it connects, right? But for the students, these classes are very powerful for the students who are not yet in ministry. Because again, we learn from each other. They're hearing all these ministry stories from other students in the class that are saying, okay, I, I'm doing this familia thing and this is what's where the Lord is, this is the testimony where the Lord is working and this is where we're running into roadblocks. <laughs> Does anybody have an idea, <laughs> right? So, so that process is how people learn and grow, right? I'm really excited right now, somewhere where I am using this, besides I would, uh, I would use this whole thing in, in pastoral theology if I was teaching it, but um, since I run the center, I'm only supposed to teach three courses a year, but I always teach more, but it's, I'm still not teaching a full load because I can't. But um, I'm teaching a class right now that I'm so excited about on globalization, poverty, and Christian mission. And I'm teaching it bilingually. I have a section in Spanish, and then I have a section in English. And I have actually two sections in English, one that's hybrid with the people there and one that's online at the same time. And then we're doing three sections during the quarter, three sessions, where everybody's together with translators. So that people are learning from each other internationally. Like what's happening in ministry in Kenya? What's happening in ministry in Korea? What's happening in ministry in Brazil, right? It's extremely powerful. Because everything is reflection action, right? Everything is, you do it, you come back, you pray, you think, you share, you do it more. That's how it works. No, but you don't learn, it's never learned up here and then you take it all and practice it. That's not how it works. We have a question. Uh, as a body of deep theological thinkers here, what are ways the BEC have read the Bible that impact how they do the work they do? What did they find in the Bible that can inspire some of us to do the same? I love that question. As you might imagine, during the time that the, the BECs were really in full flower, it was you know, a movement, um, 70s and 80s, right? And there was a lot of controversy over the BECs, specifically around this question of theological education and the BECs. Understandably, right? That a whole bunch of people who had no theological education <laughs> We're running the most vibrant church around. <laughs> what, do you, what do you do with that, right? Um, and the concerns were legitimate, right? These people are gonna go off a cliff because they don't have any tools for biblical interpretation. Right? Um, but you know, people did walk with them and they were not adverse to people walking with them, but they wanted people to walk with them. 
like people from the seminaries, like the Jesuits, like Bishop Gomez, would come and be with them and equip them where they were. It was a very organic process, right? So a lot of what you read in the liberation theologians actually came out of that interaction. Like they came there to teach the people and then the people taught them. <laughs> but then they helped the people to you know, not go off cliffs. So there was a lot of interaction that happened. So, so they actually, the liberation theologians actually put names on what they were doing biblically. So I can actually tell you some of the names that they did a lot of narrative biblical interpretation. And how I understand what that meant was that their life circumstances were actually much more similar to the life circumstances of the people in the scriptures than to, for example, our life circumstances. So a lot of them were agricultural people. <laughs> you know, they were people who lived in feudal situations. They were people who were dealing with governments that didn't care at all, right? So a lot of it made, they just could make a direct identification, an emotional direct identification. Reading the story and they would say, this is me. I am Ruth. I am Abraham. This is me. This is my story. And, and then they would learn from it in that way. So they called it narrative interpretation. That's the phrase that I read for it. But, um, but it is, you know, it is not unique to the base Christian communities. Poor people everywhere do narrative interpretation of the scripture in that way. And again, they didn't try to come up with big philosophic constructs that could be, while with, could be you know, in the vacuum of missing the 3,000 years of you know, reflection. They, they were really concerned with how do we, who is Jesus to us and how do we then live, right? And I think that, like when I go back, I read the gospel at Sonintanami every night for two years. I decided that that would be my, day, my, my evening devotions. And it was transforming because these people had never held a Bible in their hands. They had never been allowed to. And so they had no overlay between them and the word. And so they read it straight from, and they were encouraged to read it from the circumstances of their lives. So think about the Magnificat. If you had never read it before, what does it say? Right? That the poor will be given food <laughs> and the rich will be sent away hungry. And you read the reflection on this and they're saying, our children will have food. What wonderful news. And then they say, oh, but those poor rich people, they don't have to be sent away hungry. We'll feed them. Maybe they just need to go away hungry for a little bit so they understand. And then we will feed them. Don Tom Tomas, Don Tomas said, where will they go, the rich people, America? <laughs> where will they go? <laughs> but, you know, you see that they're so fresh because nobody has given them an overlay. And, and it's very provocative because, of course, there were things they saw that I wouldn't, because of the overlay I've been taught, I would not have seen. And there were things that they didn't see that we see. So, but it was so provocative in terms of awakening you to say, what does it actually say? If you hear it as a human story in which God is present, what, what is it, if you don't add a lot of theological construct, what does it actually say that then you can live by? And as you live by it, you understand more. That's part of the essence of liberation theology. There's only a few real precepts to me that are at the root of liberation theology, and none of them are anti-evangelical. The real precepts at the root. The first one is see from the perspective of the poor and marginalized. If you're going to read the Bible, you will read it from a perspective no matter what you do. <laughs> Try to see it through the eyes of the poor and marginalized. And the second one is you learn it by obeying. You do what the word says and God will reveal more to you. <laughs> that process. And third, God really cares about people's daily lives, individually and communally. <laughs> All the aspects of people's daily lives. God has a will for that that is bigger than just what happens inside you. Right? 
that's the three precepts of liberation theology in essence, from my perspective. Um, and there's nothing anti-evangelical about it. anything. None, no one of those three an evangelical can't embrace wholeheartedly. So, but all of those were in the way that they approached scripture. Hi. Uh, we were once telling our daughter she needed to be nicer to her sister, mm -hmm. and she said something along the lines of, um, no, I didn't choose to have them, you did. Oh, it sounds like the prodigal son's older brother, right? <laughs> <laughs> this son of yours. <laughs> she said, I, I, will, I will be nice to my friends who I have chosen. And it wasn't until a, a while later that I started hearing about chosen family and some of that language that was, that was being used. And the more I continue to think about it, the more I was convicted on terms of there's lots of ways that we choose who it is we will interact with and who our family, who's not in our family and those mm -hmm. kinds of things. My question is, is there something underneath that desire for chosen family that is good and that you could that you connect with familia with right. how we who who with whom we understand to be our family right. or, or how you know, would you redeem that yeah no child? i think that's a very good question um first of all i, I want to say that um teaching a globalization class that i've done a lot of reading and research on the impact of the internet this may be a strange way to enter in, but... And one of the problems with the internet is that it very effectively tribes people up. You know, you hang out with people that agree with you. What, what they've discovered is that that lowers the capacity for empathy. If God has called us, if the end goal, if the stature, the maturity, the fullness of the stature, the maturity of Christ is to love God and to love your neighbor. How are you going to learn to love people that are different from you if you don't practice? How are you going to learn to love people that are hard for you to love? How are you going to learn to love your enemies if you're not around them, <laughs> if you don't have a relationship with them? It's critically important for us to have relationships that stretch our capacity to love that force us to grow into Christ-likeness. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you can't also have relationships with people that are easier to love. <laughs> it's not either or. <laughs> In fact, sometimes it's having people around that are good for you, that bring out the best in you, that allow you to then be in relationship with people that are harder to love, right? It's not either or. Um, and I think particularly, you know, there's an awareness among young people that I think is, I was talking earlier about how each generation has a charism, at least one. There is an exquisite awareness among many young people I know as to what hurts them and what heals them. They feel it. They pay attention. My generation... We, we almost had it as a matter of pride not to pay attention. We could overcome anything, right? Just work harder. And so there's, this is a gift. Everything is a gift that is complementary. You need all the generations working together to complement each other, to balance each other, but it's still a gift, right? So sometimes you need to be with people that don't, hurt you as much. Now, I was going to say, if you're looking for a place that's completely safe, guess what? Human sin is everywhere. <laughs> um, I am going to tell one more little daughter story. <laughs> that um, my daughter is 29 now, and she is definitely her age, her generation. With, and she was, uh, you know, she would very much argue that we don't have to be with people that aren't healthy for us to be with them. But we have this conversation. And, it, and she and I trust each other and love each other deeply. So I can tell her what I see. And she can hear me. And I hope that's true both directions. 
But I said, you know, babe, you keep talking about a safe space, and you guys are constantly judging and throwing each other out. You guys who all agree with each other, you are constantly judging and throwing each other out for not being quite safe enough. I said, how safe is that really for any of you? I said, we really need a combination, given the reality of human sin, of safe spaces and brave spaces. Say that again. You have to need a combination in the world of human sin of safe spaces and brave spaces. Right? <laughs> you know? So, so yes. I'm not, I'm not asking that people who have suffered suffer more all the time, any time. You know, find spaces that feel healing, but then be brave to love your enemies because it grows you into the likeness of Christ, which is in, deep inside all of us who we want to be. We want to be a person who changes hate to love, not just a person who avoids hate, right? <laughs> Are there more questions people have? Be brave. <laughs> right, brave spaces, not just safe spaces. Thank you again so much. Two. Oh, that was good. Nice. Um, uh, thank you so much again for the lecture and for all these wonderful insights and the questions. So my question is, um, social movements, they kind of, the, they need to run themselves out of a job, right? The yeah. idea is they change yes. society. Mm -hmm. And so you've talked about the base ecclesial communities as social movements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You've also talked about their flourishing years, of, was it the 70s? 70s and 80s. 70s right. and 80s. And so my question is, as we look to the future, mm -hmm. how have base ecclesial communities changed society? Not just little lights and little intentional communities, but how have they changed society or not? Well, what's very interesting was um, there was a base Christian community at the same time period in East L.A. at Dolores Mission. And as part of, and I found out about it, was, it was people who had emigrated, who had come to Dolores Mission and started the base Christian community movement during the same, and, and in fact, I found out, this is such an interesting story when I found all the details of it, is that when they started, it was the time when gangs were on the ascendancy in East LA, and this was when gangs were on street corners, right before the internet, and um, with guns, and it was really the death toll in, you know, it was a war zone, basically, in East LA. And Dolores Mission is right in the middle of that, right? So how many of you have heard of Homeboys? Many of you, okay, best, most effective gang ministry in the world. Well, guess what? It started out of the base Christian communities. And Father Boyle will name that if you ask him. He talks about, you know, the people of Dolores Mission, but that was a base Christian community movement. Um, but one of the things that the people said, I, would, I talked to someone who'd been with the movement since the beginning, and is now elderly. And he, I said, what happened to the movement? And he said, well, it still, still sort of exists. You know, people still have these home Bible studies. He said, but... What happened was we gave birth to all of these mission projects, and then they became nonprofits. And then what did we do next? Because a lot of us were involved with those nonprofits, and then we didn't have as much time at the BEC. And then the BEC didn't all go do something together, since there were all these different nonprofits that we had given birth to that we could go be part of, right? Well, East LA is not what it was. East LA is a, is a much better place than it used to be. And that has everything to do with the programs and projects that were created by Dolores Mission's Based Christian Community Movement. You know, East, East LA is better on every measure than it was in 1980. <laughs> so, but then they've sought for where do they fit in that? And, you know, and let, let's be real, movements don't just have an arc. The powers that be kill them in many ways. So the Pope after did everything in his power to kill the movement. 
So there were sort of two forces. There was the force of, okay, we are changing our society, and then who are we now in relationship to this? And then, you know, the, the Pope doing everything he possibly could to kill the movement. And somebody, when I was talking to someone in the Philippines about that, because ostensibly it was in the name of doctrine, but he said, it, in his perspective, it wasn't actually about doctrine. He said what happened was that the, the church threw the football to the people, and they ran away with it, and the bishops ran after them and finally caught them. <laughs> so, you know, the power had shifted, and that really was the problem for the next pope. Um, so, you know, the truth, I talked about the water. It, it flows and it ebbs, and it flows and it ebbs, and it, there's always new wineskins that are needed for the pure wine of the gospel. But we always were meant to get inspiration from those who have gone before. And, but again, the way that change happens is, you know, we don't even, like I would say, people in, in East L.A. are very focused on the things that are still wrong, but they don't realize how much has changed. How they have these really good nonprofits that are community owned in East LA, like Homeboys, <laughs> that make a huge difference in the lives of people every single day. Okay. All right, friends. I'm going to ask the final question, unless you're like dying and you have one that you have to answer. If not, we're going to end with mine. Is that okay? going to be a microphone hog. Okay. Um, so you said a couple of things that stopped me in my tracks. You said that privilege means choosing your burden. Being able to choose your burdens. Being right. able to choose your burdens. And then you talked um, a little bit prior to that, the process of equipping. And you said you can't respond effectively unless you can see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was like, ooh, okay. I had to sit with that one for a moment. Um, and then you talked about linking private pain with public issues. Yeah. And right. we have this beautiful community of students that are called to this place to be a people that journey through their education together mm -hmm. for a segment of years. It's not just about um, receiving what they um, learn or read in the classroom or through textbooks or discussion posts or papers, but there's a lot to learn from one another and their mm -hmm. own stories and their own reactions. But sometimes I think we struggle with the ability to um, close the books and mm -hmm. open our eyes to the need within our brothers and sisters who are journeying in the classroom with us. Mm -hmm. um, and there's lots of need here. There's lots of opportunity here um, to become kin folk, yeah. um, but also to lean into each other's needs and to learn from each other's stories. And I'm wondering if you have any final thoughts of encouragement mm -hmm. for our students that are here, that are a people in a place for a season to do what God has called them to do here and what God has called them to do in the future. There's a couple things I want to say. And one is that, for me, the hermeneutic of suspicion is very connected to Romans 12. Right? Be to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that we are influenced by the dominant paradigm in more ways than we know, and we have to be intentionally conscious to free ourselves. So one of the ways that the dominant paradigm works is around time and efficiency. That there is a tyranny of efficiency. And it is just, it comes, it's in the air we breathe, right? And it makes it very hard to take time to be with other people that there's some part of you that says, I really shouldn't be doing this, I should be reading the book. So you have to recognize that, that that's the voice, if not of the devil, of the zeitgeist, of the cosmos, of the world. And you have to be conscious to struggle against it. Um, the other one is, I think when they talked about, one thing I didn't say about the spirituality is that they were just, and I, I, this is what I saw living with them, is they just expected miracles. Because when you're on the front lines of need and pain and struggle, but you're walking the way of the cross, not just dealing with need and pain and struggle, but in the struggle, there are miracles all the friggin' time. There just are. I just have to tell you that Jesus is so present 
in those spaces, you know, from little ways to big ways. And so I think that when you're a step removed, and being in a nice, safe place with the books is a step removed. When you're a step removed, it's easy to forget about miracles. But those miracles often happen when people are in intimate, intimate connection, when people are transparent with each other, was when the mir- God moves, when the pain is open, and, and the joy too. It's when God moves in that space. So I would say, may, you know, expect miracles and make space for God to move over against the pressure of the culture to be efficient. But don't be so inefficient that you drop out of school. I'm Lutheran, you know. We deal with this, you know, we, we deal with, Lutherans are very grounded in reality. At least we are just very, like, dark reality. I'm very funny because I'm Luther Costal. There is nobody in the Hispanic community who's not charismatic. But, but I carry this sense of the power of the Holy Spirit, but I also carry this very Lutheran, like, the world is a dark place. We live on the side of the cross, you know. Anyway, they're both true. You live with the paradox. Thank you all. Thank you. Cool. Well, yeah, um, you can take keep those off. Uh, just, um, I'm Kate Barman. I'm the co-director of the Justice and Reconciliation cohort, and I just want to take a minute and um, thank Dr. Salvatierra again for your time, your word, for your inspiration. Yeah. I was getting text messages from people that are like, oh, I've read her first book. That's her. Like people that are truly excited, like made connections. So thank you so much. Um, but also wanted to thank our guests that are part of the community that came out and joined us today. We're glad that you're here. And for faculty and staff that are here, for students for taking the time. And again, I just want to thank Dr. Felix and the JNR cohort for all of the work that you put in to the Stoudemire lecture, for bringing the good Reverend Doctor with us for the plans and the prep. So can we have a round of applause for... All right. Mm. So we're going to end in prayer, and then we're going to send you out on your way um, to enjoy your day. And we have a couple of other events through the next 24 hours. But um, thank you all for attending. So pray with me, brothers and sisters. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you for your voice, your call, your love, your care, your mercy, for the way that you have called us to pursue your justice for your people, for our brothers and sisters and kinfolk and family. And Lord, I confess, we confess that sometimes we forget that our hands and our feet have your power to bring your kingdom near from far, that you trust us with your word and you have given it as as a gift to nourish our bodies and souls, and to share it with others who need living water, who are thirsty and hungry for your word. Lord, may we be inspired by you today to take what we've encountered here, what we've encountered in your scriptures, what we've encountered in your people, what we've encountered in your classroom, what we've encountered in your church, what we have encountered by your grace, your sacrifice, your suffering, your longing, your love, your devotion, your perfect will and way in this world, that we may be inspired to leave here today with our shoulders a little more square, our eyes on you, our hearts and ears attuned to your message. May you open our eyes to see the needs around us and open our mouths to speak the needs that we have that in meeting with each other, we would see how we meet with you. Thank you for the graces of today. Pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends and family, go and enjoy your day.